Alexis' body wasn't found until seven years later. And I pray that anybody out there watching this or has... What's good guys? Welcome back to the Milk Carton Series. I'm your host Stephanie. If you are new and as always guys, thank you for tuning in. Today we're going to be discussing 17 year old Alexis Murphy. You guys probably heard of her story when it happened back in August of 2013. I remember it uh, briefly. I don't really recall too much of it. I do know that her case did get national news, but I don't really recall like really tapping in but as i was doing my research and going through different cases hers really struck out to me because it could just be another great not an example but to spread awareness because people are sick people literally watch you and we have to just you know do our part and it sucks because alexis was 17 she was excited to be taking senior pictures her parents discussed how fashionable she was, the athletic, just a goofball and someone that you wanted to be around. Alexis was last seen on August 3rd of 2013 and she was from the Shipman, Virginia era. And on this day, she was making her way to Lynchburg, Virginia. And what's so sad about it is I can only imagine like you're getting up to enjoy your day and you really just don't know what each day is going to hold. And you make your way to a gas station in Lovington. And there, you know, you're doing what you need to do, getting the stuff. And ironically, there's a man there, 55 year old Randy Taylor. Randy pretty much was in the same gas station. And as I was reading in the article, it had basically stated that he even held the door open for Alexis. Now these two didn't know each other, but I personally believe he scouted her out. People are sick and this is what people do. And I always try to like tell my friends and my family, like, do you watch your surroundings? Do you watch, you know, what a person has on, what their facial features look like. And it may be weird to some, but it's very important because you just truly never know when your last moment is. And again, you truly never know who the hell is watching you because people legit watch you when they're sick in the freaking head like that. The good thing about this case that I really liked is law enforcement was on it. Like they were on it. They legit began to do searches. They began to launch this investigation into finding Alexis. So when Alexis did not come home and she was very, very one of those, she was one of those people that, you know, she had a curfew, but she respected that curfew. So when Alexis didn't come home at her midnight curfew, her parents knew something was wrong, her grandmother as well. And they knew something like, okay, this is not like Alexis. This is out of her character. And if she was running late or she would not make it, pretty much she would call and let them know. So Alexis was driving her father's Nissan Maximum, which was like a 03 white, you know, car. And what's so crazy is after the search and the launch begins to go on, her vehicle ends up in like a movie theater parking lot. Car was found three days later from August 3rd, 2013. Her car was found in Charlottesville. So it was about a ways from where she was. So when law enforcement found out where, you know, Alexa's last movements were, she was at a gas station in, you know, Lovington and they began to get the surveillance footage and of course, talking to the cashiers and asking them, you know, if you remember anything, you know, that would basically be a point that you would want to speak up on. So she did mention how, you know, he had held the door open for her or whatever. And I wouldn't say that they knew each other, but I guess like, you know how you're in the store and you're just chit chatting, like if someone says something, you're just like, okay, like you brush it off. But I personally don't believe that she knew him at all. You know, I just think that he might've taken some type of kindness to her, but he did have a distinct neck tattoo. So this would play out and allow law enforcement to be able to kind of pinpoint who he was. And so that's how they found out who 
this, you know, mysterious man was in the surveillance video because doing proper doing the proper work and so this is when law enforcement also see his vehicle he had like a camouflage type of vehicle so of course that's gonna stick out and they see alexis car as well as tapping into her cell phone records and her cell phone pinged near this area and so <laughs> so because of the cell phone pinging off of this area where this man lives they were able to find out where he lived, which was like about a mile from the gas station, kind of living like a dirt road, you know, how it is in the country a little bit where your house is off from the, the track of the road. So pretty much what it is. So they get to his house and they said that he even had like a camera on top of his vehicle. Like his whole demeanor was a little weird. It, it was kind of said like, you know how like you meet someone and the hair stands up on your back because like they give you this eerie feeling. Well, that was kind of what Randy gave, you know, law enforcement. So law enforcement end up making their way into the house. And this is where they find a diamond studded earring. They found a piece of hair and some other things that they believed ring to Alexis. So as the story keeps unfolding, you know, law enforcement were able to see outside of like a camera view of him driving and then you see Alexis vehicle right behind him. So he basically tells law enforcement that um, Alexis and a guy by the name of Damon Brandy who has dreads and is a black man um, come to his house so that they can purchase weed and he says that they you know they're drinking beer and they're having a good time and he's laughing as he's telling the story and then he says that Alexis and the gentleman leave with this um, but I'm really angered by uh, the story that he's putting out Trina Murphy says the man arrested and charged with abducting her niece is lying. Well, why would anyone who smokes weed want a perfect stranger that they supposedly only met casually to facilitate a drug deal with them? And what drug dealer would sell weed to somebody that they don't know with a 17 year old present? Like you'd have to be an idiot. Through his lawyer, 48 year old Randy Taylor admits he was with Alexis Murphy on the night of her disappearance. He says Alexis and a black male came to his house to sell him $60 of marijuana. Her family argues the story makes no sense. Of course, Law enforcement being law enforcement, they go check out Mr. Bradley. Bradley's like, I never even met Mr. Taylor, don't even know this man, and pretty much he was not the, I guess, the last person to see Alexis. So they check in on his alibi. His alibi definitely checks out. So law enforcement then, of course, I guess they not reinvestigate, but they just ask around in town if anyone knows Randy, you know, kind of like what his personality is, what type of individual he is. And a lot of people had a lot to say that they made him, made them feel very uncomfortable. And he would always come to like the gas station and sit outside and watch people go into the store. Like he was just very weird. Excuse me. And I guess even on that day, he was in the store, he was in the store like buying porn. Like he just was on, he was just off pretty much. And so law enforcement felt like this was a sexually motivated case and they needed to speed fast in finding Alexis. Enough probable cause to get a search warrant to really search his camper because before they went in and they found notable stuff stuff you know of course that's a little bit easier to kind of like wingle but this was where it really took that turn because now that they were able to really search his camper they looked under like the couch and they found alexis shirt but alexis shirt had blood on it they found some like hair extensions and i it was like an eyelash or whatever that was like balled up into this shirt <laughs> and as they're still searching they find like this porno book where he basically has like women in this book, but their faces cut out. And one of the pictures honestly was like, I think one of his, his coworkers or something's daughter, like this man was like on some OD creepy mess, which is, it, it sucks because it's like, I wonder if he showed any other signs beforehand, you know, before he, you know, did this big act and shit. He might've even 
did something prior to Alex. So law enforcement brings in the canine dogs. The canine dogs were able to find Alexis phone on his property. It was smashed up. Why I he did that, I don't know, but like I don't think he realized it can still ping near your property, which is a blessing that she had it because they were able to pinpoint it to, you know, his property. So at this point he sits in the cell, you know, for abduction charges and they're still trying to find Alexis at this point. So law enforcement gets to this point, like, do we have a serial killer on our hands? Because a lot of other missing girls went missing in this area, especially where her vehicle was found. So at this point, they're trying to determine, do they have the right man or do we have a serial killer? So <laughs> it's like, as you read this story, you think it could get worse. So being as though there were more college girls going missing in Virginia. So he basically says, well, it's this guy, this other guy, I don't know, I can't remember his name, but it was this black man that basically killed, uh, I think her name is Hannah. He killed Hannah and he killed another girl and their bodies were found in Virginia. So he tried to basically say that this other killer had killed Alexis, but that honestly wasn't the case because DNA was mounting up on this man, like, dude, you killed Alexis, just own up. So as the pressure is on, he decides he wants to give a confession and tell where Alexis body. And so law enforcement found that they're connecting him to a 19 year old girl by the name of Samantha Clark who went missing and her body has not been found. Like they believe that if he did not get these two life terms, he would definitely had striked again. And I believe that this was not the first time at all. And I do believe if law enforcement is saying that there he's connected to the 19 year old Samantha, I personally believe he did that even before Samantha, because this, this doesn't, doesn't just happen randomly. You know what I mean? Like this builds over time and people act out on these urges that they have and I personally believe he's a known he's a rapist so he is motivated by that by that sexual you know stuff especially because you find a whole bunch of pornographic stuff in his house like weirdo Alexis body wasn't found until seven years later and I pray that anybody out there watching this or has I can't go into great details where that is because it's private property. So um, you know, it's, when time allows, we'll, we'll maybe be able to discuss a little bit more in depth. Well, what can you tell us about what led investigators to this area after seven years? Well, the searches have continued throughout the seven years. It's been continuous. Um, there's always information that comes in from time to time. Some of those leads have been fruitful, but it's just branched out and just continued to go further, further, further. Um, heard about her story and you have a missing child and you know your child is either deceased or not that they show up and this is proven that you know I have seen cases go longer than seven years of course but to not lose faith when it comes to your loved one so Alexis body was found on private property in Lovingston, Virginia in December of 2020 and her body wasn't officially confirmed that it was her until February of this year. And it sucks because, you know, her family went seven whole years without knowing and I'm really grateful that they found out where their daughter was, you know, their niece, loved one, because I can only imagine and it was like, Randy, he tried to tool with that. He tried to basically, you know, take a lesser sentence and tell what happened to Alexis so that his, you know, he doesn't get the death sentence. But I don't know. I don't even know if Virginia has that. But still, you know what I mean? It's just like you owe the family that after you took away their loved one. Can imagine the horror that she went through that day. You know, I did not kill Alexis Murphy or hurt Alexis Murphy. Do you know where she is? No, sir, I do not. And do you know what happened to her? No, sir, I do not. From the Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail, convicted killer Randy Taylor maintains his innocence relating to the abduction and murder of Alexis Murphy. There's just too many things that haven't been told for me to be convicted 
of murder of Alexis Murphy. Taylor speaking exclusively with the Newsplex just days after a Nelson County jury convicted him of the crimes in a circumstantial case. You can ask anybody that knows me, anybody in this jail, anybody around here. I'm not an outspoken person. I'm not a violent person. I haven't been mean to nobody or disrespectful to anybody in here. Uh, it's what the Commonwealth painted the story of me to be, and, and I'm not that person. Taylor does admit to speaking with Alexis on the night she disappeared last August. I smoked marijuana before, and she had asked me about smoking marijuana before, and that's all we were mainly talking about. But he maintains a third person, Damian Bradley, was also involved, despite Bradley's testimony in court that he's never met Taylor. I'm quite surprised, because that's not what happened. He knows what happened. He knows he was there. Taylor remains in jail awaiting his formal sentencing this summer, but he says he's going to fight for his innocence. Justice has not been done. There's two families here in the country. Her family and my family. And there's still no justice. There's still no closure. Until Alexis is found or returned to her family, and I'm free of these charges, there's no closure here. It sucks because she was such a beautiful girl and she had her whole life to live but sadly Randy Taylor decided to take it upon himself to play you know God and take her life all because he was sexually motivated and I just be feeling like bro there's like prostitutes out here that give it up like I don't get it at all but I guess that's not something for me to understand but all I can do is send the family love and light and I'm just grateful that they found their daughter it won't take it it won't take away the pain but it can give them some type of closure to close this chapter in their lives and move forward to grieve and continue to grieve because death is hard there's no lesson there's no time frame of how long you will grieve so I hope you guys enjoyed today's crime story. As always, sending you all love and light. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you are new. And as always, you can send me any video ideas that you want at themillcartonseries.com. Bye, guys. <laughs>